me, Emma Kenny. Thank you so much for joining me. I am still recovering from nose surgery. I'm still a bit swollen, but hopefully I'm not as swollen as I was in the last video. Although not all of the videos are in order, so this may make no sense to you whatsoever. Even more so, it will make no sense to you whatsoever if you've just come across this video and thought, this is a crime video and she's talking about facial surgery. Just go with me on this. It's one of those things, I'm recovering, I'm trying to get on with my YouTube, but my face is a little bit odd at the moment, so apologies. Hey, stay tuned, subscribe, just so you can see the healing process, if nothing else. Anyway, for all of those of you who are regularly viewing my content, thank you so much, I appreciate you massively. Today's case is one that I wanted to cover because it's not often when you're doing crime content that at the end you leave potentially with a different feeling than you would tend to when I do my normal content. Thanks as well to everybody who's listening to me on Patreon, coming in and tuning in for my podcast, and for those of you who are subscribing to my membership on YouTube. I adore you, as I do anybody who comes and leaves me a comment and gets involved. Get involved in a live chat if you've never done it. On a premiere, I do my premieres on a Wednesday and a Sunday because crime and consistency may be my catchphrase. But honestly, check it out. I always release at the same time. So if you like order in your life, and deep dive content, this is definitely the channel for you. I'm gonna be covering a case today that I think will have you on the edge of your seats. I genuinely believe that. And I want you to try to stay with me till the end. I really appreciate that it can be challenging for people to listen to crime content, even when you love true crime and you're really interested and intrigued about the stories and you wanna know exactly what happens and see justice done. Sometimes it can get a bit overwhelming, but just try to stay with me on this one. I'm gonna be covering the Jennifer Schwett case today. And this is a case that occurred in 1990. At this point, Jennifer was eight and she is just living her best childhood life, living in a ground floor apartment with her mum. They had a really close relationship as well. So it, this is a good childhood that we're talking about. She's living in Dickinson, Galveston County, which is in Texas. People who knew her said that she was a really happy, curious little girl and she had a real lust for life. She loved life. and. That kind of personality was something that anybody who had contact with Jennifer was aware of. So in August over that year, she's just enjoying the summer holidays. We all remember what that was like when we were at school. Some of you who are viewing may actually still be at school or college or university. And if that's the case, just know that I am highly envious of that stretch of summer where you actually get to have a little bit of freedom. And that's exactly what Jennifer was doing. She was just having a lovely summer holiday. She just finished her second grade. She is getting ready to start her third grade. That was when she was going to be going back to Silver Nagel Elementary. So it's an exciting time. For a lot of people who look back on childhood and certainly going to school, there's a big deal, isn't there, about getting your new shoes and making sure that your uniform looks good and maybe asking if this year your dad won't cut your hair because you know you'd like to try a normal hairdresser so that you don't end up with a fringe that goes in a completely wrong direction. Sorry, I'm just personalising that. I love my dad very much, but why at primary school they save money on hairdressers by just letting my dad have a go. My dad was a salesman. He was certainly not a hairdresser. It's not even like he was a salesman who could have been a hairdresser. He had no penchant for hairdressing at all. Anyway, that's the side. It's an exciting time, isn't it, when you're going back to school, particularly when you're happy at school. And her school was only a couple of miles from her apartment complex. Jennifer had always been afraid of the dark. A lot of kids feel that way, certainly at her age. She's very young at this point. Any parent out there or any individual who's felt the foreboding of the light switch being turned off, it's very common because you feel alone and you have all of those things going on in your divergent and curious thinking where you imagine that something horrible might be looming under your bed or in the closet or just anywhere. It's the nightmares that we bring into our reality that we don't believe are really gonna come true in our waking hours, but the minute that that dark falls, suddenly 
you do believe that you may be meeting the person out of the ring when it crawls out of your TV set at three o'clock in the morning. So she has these childhood fears and because she has such a lovely relationship with her mum and because there's obviously a mutual understanding about the fact that she has this fear, she would sleep in her mum's bed at night. So she would get the comfort and she would get that sense of peacefulness because let's face it, mums or dads, they just offer you that sense that they will protect you against all the odds. It really interests me the psychology of that. The fact that we all know that when it comes down to people like Richard Ramirez and the individuals like the Hollywood Ripper, these are people who would just disrupt your peace and safety and sanctuary no matter who you were sleeping in a bed with. But it just exonerates for whatever reason the bigger fears and you imagine that if you're staying in a bed with your mum or your dad, you just have that knowledge that somehow they're gonna protect you against all the odds. Now, Sadly, and it is unbelievably, when I talk about sliding doors moments, this is a classic example of a regrettable sliding doors moment. So it's the 10th of August, 1990, and she's in bed with her mum and Jennifer gets woken up by her mum during the night. And the reason for that is Jennifer's having quite a restless night. She's just kicking her mum, she's keeping her awake. You know how it is when somebody is maybe having dreams or nightmares and they're moving around in bed next to you and you've got a big day the next day and you know you have to get some sleep or you're just not going to be in a good place. And that's exactly what was going on for her mum. She had a really early start with work the next day. Jennifer is interrupting her sleep and the consequence is in the end her mum wakes Jennifer up and just says, would it be okay if you mind sleeping in your bed just this once. I often go downstairs in my own home to sleep because my husband snores. We all know when we have something on the next day that this is completely natural because otherwise it could end in divorce or maybe not doing well in what you do at work. But this is exactly what's going on in this moment in time. So Jennifer just obediently goes to her own room. She turns the light on. And then because she wants to keep herself amused, she's obviously a little bit nervous about being in the room by herself. So she gets the change out of a piggy bank and she starts to count it. And then she eventually drifts off to sleep. Like that lovely scene of a child literally counting to get back to sleep. The innocence, the naivety, the absolute tranquility and sanctuary of childhood is demonstrated in those actions, isn't it? And what is truly striking, shocking, disturbing is that it's unbelievable on the one occasion that Jennifer's mum actually asks Jennifer to go and sleep in her own room, a predator is literally lurking outside. Jennifer's fell asleep. She was counting her money. She's reached a slumber. The next thing Jennifer is aware of is she comes round and she's in the arms of a man. And it's not a man she recognises. This is in the middle of the night and he's running down the street with her. So he's carrying her. This is completely outside the realms of her normal, her reality. She instantly knows that something is very wrong. She's just wearing a t-shirt at this moment in time. She's got her underwear on, but aside from that, she's obviously outside in the elements. She starts to panic and she tries to scream. Of course she tries to scream because at the end of the day, all she wants is a mother. She's been terrified of the dark and here she is living out a worse nightmare. A man, a stranger has taken her from her home, is running away from her home with her in his arms. As she tries to scream, he puts his hand over her nose and mouth. It's impossible for her to make any noise. Then he says, he's an undercover copper. He tells her to calm down. Now imagine that. Imagine being a child. You're being taken by this strange man. You're terrified. And all you want to believe is there is a reasonable explanation. Every instinct in your body is telling you something is really badly, dangerously wrong. But then this person says, I'm an undercover police officer. And suddenly you're like, okay, that would make sense because I can rationalize that police put you in situations that you don't understand, but for your own protection. And my God, would you want to cling to that if you were Jennifer in that moment? So she's immediately torn. 
She knows that she's going to be wary of strangers. She's scared by this man that she doesn't know, but she also knows that police officers are the good guys. The police officer who is in charge of her in this moment, as far as she's concerned, is somebody that she's been brought up to trust. What harm could she come to if this guy is genuinely a police officer? And also, what does that say about this predator? He knows exactly what a child is going to think. It's going to make a child behave because they are authoritative. You don't misbehave in front of a police officer because the chances are you'll think you'll get into trouble. You'll do what you're told because they're there for your protection. On top of that, you'll have a level of fear. Authority always provokes a little bit of fear in the majority of human beings. So telling her that as a predator, it's a powerful ruse. And of course, whilst it doesn't mean that she will completely comply, it suggests that it will disarm her in the moment and allow him to carry on with his evil, sordid plan. So the man carries her to his car. Then he sits her in his lap and he drives away. The very fact that he sits her in his lap instantly draws our attention to the fact that that is outside the context of what a police officer would do. A police officer is not going to want to have a child on his lap whilst driving. Firstly, that's illegal. Secondly, it's inappropriate. What you would do by having a child in your lap, unless you are a parent, of course, and you're trying to comfort that child, you are controlling them. You're making it very difficult for them to move. If you are driving a car and they are sat on your lap, your arms act as barriers. Jennifer noticed that they even drove past her grandparents' house. So she's seeing these familiar moments, these places of sanctuary just passing her by. A short distance later, he pulls into the park of her elementary school. So this is where she goes to school. This is her territory. This is familiar to her. And again, it's confusing. Why is he brought her to the school? He turns off the engine. And at this point, he offers a sweets. Now, even though she had not necessarily decided in this moment in time whether she was dealing with a predator or a police officer, there is something that is resounding for her. She's absolutely been told a million times by her mum, you never accept sweets from strangers. So she says no. She refuses. That's despite him claiming to be a police officer. She knows at this moment in time that even though he's telling her one thing, she's feeling something very differently. She's feeling that there's something very sinister about this situation. First off, her mum was not one of those mums who would go out and leave her with other people. And actually, if her mum did go out, it would be her grandparents that looked after her. So she was very much coddled in that family care. Her mum was very protective of her. And one of the things about her mother that you will see in interviews with her is she just has this complete devotion to her daughter. You know, it's just her and her daughter against the world, so to speak. And when you have insight into those interviews and you watch the pain and the agony that individual is going through, you can see that protectiveness just playing out. At this point, Jennifer starts to realise she's been kidnapped. She realises this doesn't make sense because not only is he offering her streets, he's taken her on his lap, he's taken her from her room without her mother, he's now smoking cigarettes in the car, he's drinking beer in the car. Then he's aware that she's starting to become nervous and agitated. So he says to her, you don't need to worry about anything. Your mum's going to come and pick you up from the car park shortly. And he actually suggests that, to pass the time, just look at the moon whilst they waited. Jennifer obviously is complying. She's looking at the moon, but she's looking around and she's just waiting. She knows her mother would come because her mum always comes. She knows that her mother's her protector. She knows that if her mother had genuinely said that she was coming to pick her up, then her mother's car would be drawing in to that school car park ASAP. But the headlights of her mum's car don't arrive. There's no sign of her. Eventually, after a period of time, this predator turns to her and says, your mum's not coming. And then starts driving again. Now, in retrospect, we all know her mum was never coming to collect her. Her mum had no idea that this predator 
this sinister human being had stolen her daughter. And the truth is, I think he was in that car park, drinking and smoking and genning himself up, just psyching himself up to go ahead and do what he was about to do next. About a mile or so further down the road, he turns the car into a dead end gravel track and he parks on this overgrown patch of land. Jennifer is now alerted to the fact that this is really strange. You know, the reality of where she is and what is happening is slowly sinking into this little tiny girl's brain. And even though she has few years to have developed wisdom, there is a maturity within her mindset that lets her recognize this is not right. She's really concerned and she's clever and she's curious. So she starts questioning the man. She says about him being a police officer and she asks him, if you're a police officer, where's your gun and where's your badge? Very, very bright. I don't think I'd have had the wherewithal to have even muttered those words in that situation, but there she is. She's trying to find out, she's trying to pin him to having to answer questions that are difficult if he's lying. So initially he says, I don't have them with me. You can imagine that that would instantly make her feel, hang on, this guy has said he's a police officer. They always have the badge with them. Why would he not have it? Particularly if he's on duty. Then he says, I have a big gun. It's on the back seat. And Jennifer's not satisfied with that. She's not satisfied with this answer. She wants proof. She wants evidence. So she stands up in the front seat. She looks into the back of the car. She can't see any weapon. And then it happens. It's at this moment, the man just loses control turns into an animal. The attack that was launched on Jennifer's little body is unbelievably callous and beyond grotesque and beyond destructive. She didn't stand a chance. She was eight years old. She weighed just 45 pounds. That's just over three stone. She was tiny. He rips down her underwear, and then he climbs on top of her on the front seat. He licked her body all over, and then he takes a pocket knife and he holds it to her throat, and then he asks her the questions, the diabolical question, am I scaring you, little girl? Am I scaring you? What kind of a human asks that question, knowing the answer? knowing that there is ultimately only one answer, that the sheer terror that's being evoked in the individual that you're threatening. She's eight years old. Now, aside from feeling absolute terror, absolute panic, Jennifer doesn't actually recall much of what happened next, but she does remember that he did forcibly strangle her on at least four occasions. Also, she recalls that he tried to break her neck. Eight years old. And this man is doing this to her. She lapses in and out of consciousness during the attack. Of course she does. The next thing that she becomes aware of, she's outside. At this point, the man's holding onto her ankles. She's naked and he's dragging her on her back. He's dragging her by her feet. And she recalls the feeling of twigs just digging into her skin. And she's trying to call out because obviously she wants help. And she realizes that for some reason she can't. But instinctively in that moment, something comes into her mind, to her senses. And she realizes, if I want to get out of this alive, the only way I will do so is to play dead. She realizes that if he notices, even for a second, that she's still breathing, then he will finish the job that he believes he has already completed. This predator drags her into a large field and then he finally drops her legs and he just dumps her. And he dumps her with a head on a fire ant hill. If any of you have been bitten by fire ants, as I have, you will know how painful they are. My feet ended up on top of one of those and I can tell you now, it created a dance move I have never, ever been able to recreate before. It looked a little bit like I was having some kind of seizure. 
and I will never forget the instantaneous heat that was created by those. But can you imagine being injured after this kind of trauma and this man has just discarded her and discarded her on this fire ant hill? He then walks away and he walks away leaving her for dead. As far as he's concerned, he has murdered this little girl. She hears in the distance a car door slam and then she hears the car pull away. For some reason, at this point, Jennifer realises that she can barely move, but she summons the strength to move one of her hands up to her throat. She has this instinct, remember, she can't make a noise, and so she's interested about what's going on there, as well as obviously concerned and panicked. And as she manages to place her hand onto her throat, she realises, to her absolute horror, there's a gaping wound there. And then she looks at her hand and it is just drenched in blood. What she didn't realise with respect, and thank God she didn't realise at this point, is that she'd been brutally sexually assaulted and raped by the man. And what she hadn't realised until that moment was that same horrific predator had even cut her throat from ear to ear. And he'd cut her throat so deeply that her vocal cords had been completely severed. She's eight. Only hours earlier, she was in bed with her mother, sleeping peacefully, or restlessly at least, to a point where she'd been asked to go into another room. She counted her money, she went to sleep, and now she's laying in a field, naked, with her throat cut. Eight years old. Jennifer spent the next 12 to 14 hours, guys, 12 to 14 hours. She was naked, she was lying in the field, she couldn't move, she couldn't even alert people to her being there because she couldn't make the slightest sound and she's barely clinging to life as she's slowly bleeding to death because of these horrific injuries that have been inflicted with the pocket knife to her throat. Meanwhile, bear in mind, she's been placed on a fire ant hill and so they are crawling all over her. The sting in her head, the sting in her body. These ants, by the way, are absolutely notorious for the intense pain caused by a single sting. I am testament to that. So Jennifer, who is already in such a terrible state, must have been in unbelievable agony from the stings alone. But sometimes, whether you believe it's God, whether you believe it's fate, whether you just believe it's luck, there is this amazing culmination of things that do something incredible. Because in hindsight, it seems that those fire ants, they might just have saved a life. The intense pain from each sting, well, it causes her to come round each time she slips into unconsciousness. Also, unbelievably, the venom in those ants sting helps to congeal the blood pouring from the gaping wounds of her throat. So it stops her from rapidly bleeding to death. Against all the odds, it seems like she's destined to live. And on top of this, the fact it was drizzling, the weather had that light, drizzly rain. It helps to keep her wounds moist, and that increases her chances of survival. Jennifer recalled that whenever she came round, whenever she regained consciousness, she couldn't believe that she wasn't dead. And even though she was helpless and she couldn't move, she was still aware that there were odd cars passing by out the corners of her eye. But she couldn't move, she couldn't call out to someone help, she just lay there helplessly, she just watches as the night becomes day. But she also describes this feeling of peace, this sense that she knew she was going to die potentially, but that she felt that that was okay, that she felt this sense of peace that she was going to die. Now, meanwhile, of course, Jennifer's mother has discovered her gorgeous, beautiful little girl missing. You know, she's gone into her daughter's room the following morning and Jennifer's not there. Instantly, she can see something sinister has happened. The window is wide open. Jennifer's gone. She's utterly distraught. Of course, her first call is to the police. She expresses concern that her apartment is on the ground floor and it backs onto a car park. So if somebody is going to abduct a child, then this is the perfect opportunity for them to be able to do that. 
So she fears instantly just seeing that scene and expressing to the police that her daughter has been abducted. Officers are there quickly and it's not long at all before they come to the same conclusion. And so Jennifer's suspected kidnapping gets reported on the news and then police officers and fire crew and volunteers are soon combing the local area. Literally thousands of flyers were handed out. We all know how important, how integral to bringing a child back is the first few hours. Literally, if you don't bring the child back within the first 12 hours, you're looking usually at a very negative outcome. So they're desperate as a community to find this child. All the while, Jennifer knows none of this is happening. All she is experiencing is that she is lay bleeding to death in a field a few miles away. She was there for more than 12 long, tortuous hours. It gets to early evening. It starts beginning to get dark again. Bear in mind that Jennifer's scared of the dark anyway. And the monsters that she was afraid of, they have materialized in the most catastrophic ways. That man, he arrived in her world, stealing her from her safety. He is the monster that she has feared all those years. And it's come to be a reality. Jennifer recalls that she comes around a final time, essentially. And it's at this moment that she hears children and they're playing nearby. A group of kids are just playing TIG right in the field where she lay. And then unbelievably, miraculously, wonderfully, one of them trips over Jennifer's foot. At this point, she loses consciousness again. Those kids, they're the heroes in this story. They quickly summon the help and the police are soon on the scene. At this point, Jennifer wakes up again and the policeman kneeling beside her told her, you've been found, you're gonna be okay. Just please stay with me, please stay with me. On one level, we can all go, wow. That's just so emotional, it's so powerful. This little girl finally in the arms of a hero. But remember, this man is a police officer. Men will no doubt have become somebody that she can't trust at this moment because the last man who had her, who did this to her, said he too was a police officer. So whilst there may have been relief on one level, she must have been terrified on another. What would be safe in her world at this moment in time? Her mother, just her mother, I imagine. They then airlift Jennifer to hospital because she's in such a tragic, tragic state. And I'll be honest with you, the emergency paramedics, they did not hold out any hope for that little girl. When they saw her in the state she was in, the injuries inflicted on her were ultimately so severe that they couldn't imagine that she could make it through. Also, she'd been left alone in such a critical state and they could tell, even though they hadn't got the absolute evidence in that moment in time, they had a strong suspicion, at least, that she'd been sexually assaulted. Also, they noted that she was, of course, completely covered in ant bites. They saw she'd been dragged because they could see that she got injuries and scratches all over her back. She got marks to her face that had been inflicted by him during that horrific assault. And where the whites of her eyes should have been, they were just burst blood vessels because he'd attacked her and strangled her and tried to break her neck to such a degree that they'd all burst in her eyes. So that's the level of injury that those paramedics are meeting when they are looking after Jennifer. When they get her to the hospital, it's incredible because she's alert and she's conscious. She's really terrified. What's again incredible when you think about what this man did to her and you think about the fact that he's gone through her vocal cords, when they actually examine the injury to the throat, he'd missed all major arteries. Like I said, sometimes whatever your belief system, there is this culmination of possibilities that seem so unbelievably rare to all play into one moment and yet it's happened with Jennifer. Doctors insert a tracheotomy tube and they repair the gaping wound. She then spends two weeks in hospital. They have a nurse that stays by her bed 24 seven. That's until her condition stabilizes and her family could also visit. Her doctors tell her mother that due to the physical trauma caused by the rape, 
there's a strong likelihood that she would never be able to have children in the future. Imagine being Jennifer's mother and hearing that that little girl that you protect, protect so deeply that you have her in your bed most nights to make her feel safe. And here you are feeling powerless because this man, this predator, has potentially stolen the future generations of your family. I cannot imagine the weight that Jennifer's mother would have to bear in that moment to know that information before her child is old enough to know that information, to carry that. When Jennifer's stable and the police are able to come in and speak to her, well, officers do face a problem because firstly, she can't speak. She literally could not make a sound. And the doctor said that because she had literally had her vocal cords cut and the horrific damage clearly had been inflicted, the truth was that they doubted that she'd ever even be able to make a noise again. On top of that, she'd been lied to by a man who said he was a police officer and now men represent something pretty terrifying. So Jennifer was absolutely mortified, petrified, terrified of any man going near her. And actually she tried to kick one of the male doctors in the stomach and that just says what a fighting little spirit she had, didn't she? I mean, think about how far this child has come. She's shown more strength in her little finger than I've shown in the majority of my lifetime. She's a survivor. And even in hospital where essentially there are people watching her and she's being looked after, she's not taking any chances. She's letting people know I may not have a voice, but I can still demonstrate with my actions, my feelings. And that feistiness is just admirable, isn't it? Understandably, one of the main fears that she had was of male police officers because they had become terrifying for her. Now, at this point, bear in mind, the investigators don't really understand why she's terrified of police officers, particularly male police officers, because she can't speak. So they've not got to a point where they can really question her on what is concerning her about them being around her. Now, she had to deal with the male doctors and the police officers constantly around her bed and the hospital room. And that meant that Jennifer spent those two weeks in hospital absolutely horrified and terrified. She was in such an anxious state because of course, she's just waiting for one of these apparently trusted parties to harm her again to finish the job that this other man had started. Finally, officers get the red light to speak to Jennifer through Jennifer's mother. So they ask her questions at this point and she communicates those questions to Jennifer. But it's really frustrating for this little girl. You know, she can remember the events of her attack in incredible detail, but she can't communicate them. Ultimately, Jennifer begins to write notes for the officers in response to their questions. And she is such a bright little cookie. She's very advanced in her intellect to some degree, certainly in her expression of understanding. Because again, remember how small and little and young she is, but she provides so many valuable details. Genuinely, it's outstanding what this girl remembers. She remembers that this man had taken her from her bed. She also knows that this man's name was Dennis. And this demonstrates that he absolutely, without a doubt, planned to kill her. So he had no qualms about telling her his name. He also told her that he was the undercover cop. So she tells them that. She describes the attack. She describes having her throat cut with the pocket knife. She describes the colour of his car. She also is able to indicate that the car itself has got many dints in the side. She describes the beer he was drinking. She said he was drinking Bud Light. And she recognises that he was smoking the brand of cigarettes known as Marlborough. So she's really taken this in. But on top of all of that detail, crucially, Jennifer is able to give a really detailed description of her attacker. She describes him as young. She says maybe he's in his 30s. And bear in mind, when you're a kid, anybody over the age of 15 looks like they could be running a company. At the end of the day, we've all been there, haven't we, when we were a kid? You're like eight or nine. You look at young people who are maybe five years older than you and you're like, oh, one day I'll be a woman or a man like them. So age is a difficult one to decipher when you're a child, but she gets it. She knows that's what she believes he fits into. And she's so accurate with this. She says he's white with a black moustache. 
noted that he looked greasy. She said that he might have had a scar on his face. She remembers he wore glasses, that he had one or two green tattoos. And she helps a forensic artist create this sketch of the subject. And she did this because what you do is you look through facial features in these books that help the artist to put the picture together. And she was able to do that and point out the correct ones. So it's pretty soon after that they released the drawing to the public and the media. So now they have an e-fit, so to speak, of the potential suspect. She was utterly traumatised, bear in mind. But in spite of the fact that she was traumatised and she's reliving her trauma, having to go through these details, having to describe this heinous predator who's done this to her, but she is 100% determined that that attacker, that that man who has caused her such grave harm is going to be brought to justice. And her main motivation is that he won't be able to hurt any more children. She's eight and they're her feelings. A quarter of a mile from the crime scene as they start to investigate where the crime was played out, police are able to find discarded clothing in a ditch. They find the pink t-shirt, and the white underwear with blue roses. That's what Jennifer had been wearing. Also, very importantly, they find a man's underwear and they find a t-shirt. Immediately, they suspect that this belongs to the man that they were looking for. But aside from that, there was very little other evidence that the police could go on. The time frame that we're talking about right now is that at this point, really, DNA profiling, it was in its infancy. This is 1990. So even though in the future it's potentially viable, in that moment in time when they're seeking out the person who attacked Jennifer, there isn't much to go on. Whilst the investigators are doing their best to piece together the puzzle of possibility to bring this predator to justice, Jennifer, of course, is going about her recovery and, my God, I cannot even begin to describe what a warrior this child is. So first of all, she's being told that she's never gonna speak again. But within two weeks, two weeks, she makes a sound. And I love how she makes a sound and why she makes a sound. We've all been a child. We've all been told no by our parent, haven't we? All been told no. So Jennifer is basically asking her mum for a chocolate bar and her mum is being a good mum and like, no. I don't know, she's in hospital, she's been a victim. At the end of the day, she's probably ate a lot of chocolate because people are just like, just give her a chocolate bar, she's had an awful time. Definitely that's how it would be if I had a child and they'd been put in a situation like this. I'd be like, you want a horse? I'll bring it to the hospital later on. That's how you feel. It seems however, Jennifer's mother has some good boundaries and she's like, no, you've had enough chocolate. But Jennifer, remember, this is a feisty little warrior. She's like, I'm not having that. I want my chocolate bar. So she tries to call out her uncle's name because she's like, if you're not getting me the chocolate bar, I'm gonna go for the soft touch uncle. He'll get me a chocolate bar. And you know damn straight, he'd have gone and got the chocolate bar. She manages to make this sound. It's a frustration and her annoyance that she's not getting what she wants. And suddenly she manages to make that noise. It's so heartwarming, isn't it? To just take such an ordinary experience of a child's reaction and to suddenly see the enormity of what that means, what that reaction actually represents. She stays in the hospital for a while and then obviously she gets discharged and she's actually really reluctant to leave and I completely understand that. It's a bit like being institutionalised in any scenario, isn't it? When you've been in a place that you're used to and it feels safe, even if it's not perfect, because it kind of has its rhythm and its rules, it follows that you feel a level of security. And also for her, it had become her safe haven. She'd had people looking after her 24 seven, she'd had a family there, and she knew that nobody could harm her there. Why would she wanna go back into the world? And she's scared. But again, this incredible personality is just astoundingly resilient because once she gets home, this incredible recovery continues. At the start of term, bear in mind when this attack happened in August, at the start of her school term, She's able to go back to school. Don't get me wrong, I'm not for one minute saying that she's got past this crime because she wasn't able to. She never got past the events of that night. You know, she worked tirelessly, absolutely tirelessly, because she wanted to know who this attacker was. 
but they couldn't find him. There were no new leads and there were no new suspects. And so as the time passed, ultimately the case went cold, but it would never go cold for Jennifer. For Jennifer, it was never gonna be over. She was absolutely determined that there was no way that she would ever give up on what had happened to her unless the man who carried this horrific crime out on her was caught. Understandably, members of her family wanted her to move on, to get past it. They wanted her to forget him. They didn't want him to have any power over her future. And I understand that. You know, we want success to be the greatest revenge, but it's also really important to recognize that for Jennifer, this man was still out there. He could be doing this to other children. He could be harming other human beings. And for her, that was a weight to carry. She was always scared of being left alone. Of course she was. And she remained really fearful of men for some time. Of course she did. They'd become a place of vulnerability for her, an area where she couldn't trust. She was constantly terrified that her attacker was going to find her and he was just going to come and finish off the job that he'd started. And can you imagine trying to go through your early years as a teenager holding on to those feelings, dealing with the physical scars, the mental scars, the emotional scars and the social scars? And in this case, the relational ones, because when it comes down to the opposite sex, is it possible to trust that men are good? The years pass. Jennifer does get on with her life. She tries to live her best life as possible and as normally as possible as well. She graduates high school, she attends college, she gets married, and she secures a job that she loves. She secures a job as a librarian. She did during this period of growth and change and progress, learn that she needed to forgive the man who did this to her. She couldn't allow him to dominate her feelings by feeling anger and feeling tied to that moment. So she lets it go, she forgives him. But that doesn't mean that she doesn't want him apprehended because she doesn't want anybody else to suffer at his hands like she did. So even though she moves forward and her life is good, she won't let it go. Now, after there have been no developments at all in the case for years, things change in 2008. This is almost two decades after the attack that nearly killed Jennifer. At this point, a guy called Tim Cromie, he's a detective with the Dickinson Police Department, he starts working on the case. Now, this guy is a special crimes investigator and his specialism, it was dealing with child abuse and sex crimes. Now well, for Jennifer, hey, this is like two decades later. She is skeptical. Why is a new guy coming onto a case that has essentially gone cold, where there has been so much time and distance between the origin and where we are now, that he's gonna be able to shed any new light on it? So she kind of doesn't expect very much to come from this. Her case had been passed from pillar to post and they had had absolutely no results for years. But Crum is different. And he actually says to her, I promise you that throughout my career, I'm gonna dedicate myself for what I've got left to ensuring that I find out who your attacker is. That he was gonna dedicate the rest of his years in service to making sure that that man was brought to justice. And Jennifer said it was something about the way that he committed to her, the way that he dedicated his sentiments around the meaning of what went on for her in that night that changed her life forever. She said that for the first time, like her, she'd met somebody who was truly dedicated. So Cromie comes in, joins forces with the FBI, and he gets involved with a special agent called Richard Renison. So now there are these real experts on the case. So straight away, they start going through all of the details that they've got and they send the clothes found at Jennifer's crime scene to the DNA lab again. Now, bear in mind, we're two decades since 1990. So we're in a place where DNA profiling is just so incredible compared to what it used to be. So these incredible increases and advances that have been made in the interim have really opened up possibilities and they're there. They send those clothes over, hoping that it's going to give them the break, finally, that they're looking for. Over a year later, over a year, a DNA profile is obtained from the clothing. 
They ran it through CODIS, which is the combined DNA index system, incredibly, and match came back. Her attacker's DNA profile was already in the system. And the reason it was in the system was because this individual had not been the greatest of human beings. In fact, he'd been involved in an assault on a woman that the man had met in a bar in Arkansas in 1996. That's six years after the attack on Jennifer. Also, it bore strikingly similar aspects to Jennifer's attack. So he'd threatened the woman with a knife. He'd then kidnapped her. He'd assaulted her. And he had been apprehended for this crime and he was sentenced to 12 years. But, shockingly, he'd only served four, which really takes my breath away. I mean, somebody who threatens somebody with a knife, kidnaps them and assaults them, they get 12 years, but they only serve four. I appreciate that overcrowding is a problem in prisons, but with respect, four years is not representative of the type of assault that went on there. I mean, let alone what we know about what he's done to poor Jennifer. If he had actually been inside for 12 years, that would have kept the public safe from this kind of human predator. Turns out that the suspect that's got the match in the DNA, well, there is another incredible connection with the crime because his name is Dennis Earl Bradford. Remember what Jennifer said? He was called Dennis. The man who attacked her was called Dennis. After this man gets released in 2000, guess what? He'd gone on to marry and he'd had three stepsons. By this point, he was living in Arkansas and he was working as a welder. In fact, it appears at this point, he was living a regular life. So those people who looked into his world, they couldn't have imagined for one second the absolute darkness of his history. Aside from this amazing breakthrough with the DNA match, the police are also now looking at the other evidence that was put together when the initial crime was carried out and they find Jennifer's notes that she'd written for the investigators at the hospital. And then one in particular catches their attention because as I've mentioned, it's written down in plain sight for them. She wrote the name Dennis. So this is all coming together. Now, even though that is compelling, right? This is absolutely compelling. They need more. So Chromium Renison want to make sure that this man is absolutely bang to rights. They want to make sure that when they go to ensure that this can be prosecuted and they take it to be looked at, there is going to be a no brainer. So they now need to prove that Bradford has been in Dickinson in 1990, which is when Jennifer was attacked. So they searched the local records in Dickinson. They searched through the index cards, the arrest reports. And guess what? They discover a Dennis Earl Bradford. Why? Turns out he'd been arrested in Dickinson in 1987. So that's about three years before the attack on Jennifer. Turns out he was a former Dickinson resident. In fact, he had lived at two addresses close to Jennifer's and her mother's apartment. The pieces of the jigsaw are coming together. Further investigation, it reveals a copy of Bradford's driving license from 1990. And guys, it is just unbelievable. She was eight. She had gone through something that very few of us can imagine surviving. And yet she remembered that man's face in such detail that when they looked at the photo fit that she'd created with the artist and the driving license, they were almost identical. It was unbelievable the match that was made. And Renninson actually stated that he had never seen such an accurate drawing in his career. That was how adept this little girl was at recapturing the features of that man who harmed her that evening. On the 13th of October 2009, this is after more than 19 years, Jennifer gets the call that she'd been waiting for. She's advised that an arrest has been made and that the suspect was in custody. One can only try to conceive how that would feel for Jennifer. She's a grown up, she's a woman, she's married, she's living a life, potentially giving up hope for ever finding this man. And then in a millisecond, everything changes when they tell her they have him. They bring him in for questioning. And at this point, Bradford was asked if he was familiar with the name Jennifer Schwett. He confirms he was. He said he recalled her 
story in the news about her abduction at the time. Of course he did. Classic. You don't want to seem deceptive, so, you know, if you look a little bit odd by saying you don't know, even though it happened in your area, chances are the police will be like, well, that's very weird, because it was all over the news, and there were, like, thousands of volunteers seeking and searching for her. So he plays into the, yeah, yeah, I heard about it, you know, there was an abduction at the time. So then they ask him a little much more of a further question, which is, had you ever come into contact with her? At this point, he says, yeah, I did. Now... They push him to explain. Okay, so how did you come into contact with her? And in fact, at this point, he refuses to give any details. And when they ask him why, you know what he said? He chillingly replies, you did your homework. Oh, so he knows that they know. And it's almost like it sounds he's been waiting for this moment. He's expected this at some point. So the interview just takes this completely unexpected turn because whilst he hasn't confessed, the response clearly indicates that he knows what's coming. The investigators then advise Bradford that Jennifer had survived the attack. Not only survived, she had thrived and that she was alive and that she was well. Even though Bradford knew on the news that Jennifer had been abducted, he had never followed up on the outcome. He assumed he'd killed that little eight-year-old girl. He'd left her for dead in a field with her throat cut. How on earth could he have imagined even for a second that she would have survived? And here, in that moment, he's told, you didn't murder her. She made it. It is unbelievable to watch him in the interrogation when he just breaks down in tears and says, thank goodness. It's genuine relief. I will give him that. Sometimes we have predators and serial killers that we talk about and there is literally no remorse whatsoever. They have no concern or care or compassion running through their veins at all. And I'm not saying for one minute that this man is a good man. He isn't. He's a horrendous human being. But what I am saying is there is a level of conscience. His reaction evidence is that. He's not reacting because he's now not going down for murder. He's reacting because that has stayed with him to some degree. And I'm glad. I hope it bore heavy on his shoulders every second of every moment of every day. I hope it kept him awake at night. I hope it infected every moment of potential joy and darkened it from the moment that he carried out that attack. I really hope that every waking second was drenched in dread. And I hope that every night he went to sleep was full of terrors haunted by Jennifer. I wish that for him. You ever heard the name Jennifer Schuett? Yes. Did you ever have occasion to come in contact with her? Yes. Tell me about that. No. My whole life, for the past 20 years, has been utterly and completely up because of my mistake. I can tell, obviously, this affects you a lot, but I think you would, if you were to see her, I think you would be extremely proud of her. I really do. Oh, thank you. She's alive. Yes, she's alive. She's alive. She's alive. Two days 
later, I ran. And I just took off. He said, not a single day goes by where I don't see that baby. There was no other side to that story. She was an innocent and I was a sick, deranged, beat up little effing punk. She wasn't anybody I knew. I don't remember why I pulled up at those apartments and I walked over to that window. I remember it was open and I could see in it and the light was on and I pulled that little girl out of that window and I put her in my car and she was freaking out. And I told her, please, just don't worry, it'll all be all right. I told that little girl that I was a police officer and that everything would be okay. I pulled off this little road and that little girl, she was just so scared and I lost it. I was like a savage animal. I took that little girl out there and I raped her and I cut her throat. I don't know why. I've never known why. Well, I mean, I've got some suggestions as to why. I mean, I think your assumption about you being a sick little punk may be something that I align myself with, but you did it because you were a selfish human being who bore no care and consideration for anybody or anything other than your own warped desires. You are a child molester, stroke, child murderer if you'd had it your way. You are the lowest of the low, the sickest of the sick, the darkest of the dark. And you know what? You don't get to feel guilty and have people accept that guilt without us also noting that you didn't turn yourself in. You know, I don't care that you say that you lived for two decades with the guilt. There's a simple way of dealing with it. You walk into a police station, you say, hey, you know that little girl who had her throat cut? You know that little girl who had her childhood broken because of me? Who had potentially her future childbearing opportunities completely decimated because of me? I'm the guy you need to send down because I did it. Then at that point, we'll be like, well, you're still all the terrible things that we've related to you about in this particular content today, but at least you have seen that what you did was reprehensible. At least you are trying, albeit in a way that will never make amends, to make some form of amends. He also apparently has tried after killing Jennifer in his head, because remember, he thought he'd murdered her, that he tried to take his own life, but he says he didn't have the guts. That's quite mind-blowing, isn't it? You have the guts to murder an innocent child in your head, but you don't have the guts to just, I don't know, save society the issue of having to look after you in the future. But again, it says something about ego, doesn't it? Look, the idea that people who kill themselves are cowards is just so far from reality. It is mind-shockingly and mind-bendingly untrue. It blows me away every time somebody calls somebody who's suicidal a coward. The truth is that the vast majority of human beings, we have a really high-level survival mechanism, just like Jennifer, when she was laying in that field. Very, very, very much a survivor. That's what was kicking in. And that's what keeps us going in some of the most horrific circumstances. So the idea that you can just kill yourself because you're having a terrible time, you've done a terrible thing, it doesn't stand to reason in the moment that you can go ahead and do it. It's actually really difficult. So even though he's trying to suggest that he does feel really guilty, it turns out that the result of that guilt is that he puts the hole in a roof with his dad's shotgun, doesn't actually harm himself, and then carries on living. Hmm. Like I said, highly convenient guilt. Bear in mind, guilt should be a motivator. It makes you change your ways. Hmm. Not very convinced it changed his ways, right? Also, bizarrely, after he tried to kill himself, albeit that he didn't hurt himself in any way, shape or form, he gets put onto a psychiatric ward and it's incredibly in the same hospital that Jennifer was in at the time. Unreal, right? I mean, the predator, the victim, same hospital. Oh, really, really awful that he's getting treated well while she's getting treated well. He's getting nursed back to health while she's getting nursed back to health. It feels so unjust in that moment. Investigators, of course, they've got exactly what they want now because he hasn't drawn out this confession. You know, he's admitted it. And they're able to tell Jennifer that this man 
is now fully banged to rights. They have a case against him. And the next day, after they tell her that this is the case, she goes and sees her attacker again. This is through one-way glass. It's the first time that she's seen him in nearly 20 years. And she's actually really relieved because she didn't recognise him. And that meant something to her. It meant something to her that she didn't know this man. He was a total stranger. She had never seen him before. She'd never seen him since. She had really been afraid that if she'd seen him and noted that he was maybe an old friend of her mother's or a friend of the family, that would have just been absolutely horrifying for her because it would have felt familiar. It would have invaded her circle of trust, so to speak. The investigators also tell Jennifer about the fact that he tried to kill himself in 1990 and she just tells them, don't let him kill himself. She wants her day in court. She wants her justice. She doesn't want this man to be allowed to escape. Bradford gets charged with Jennifer's rape and attempted capital murder. He's remanded in custody whilst the case progresses to trial. His attorney also indicates that there's not going to be a contest here. He's going to plead guilty. He doesn't want to drag things out. He knows that he's guilty. He recognises that a trial would be incredibly challenging for Jennifer, who he's already made suffer enough. Because he had a history of suicide, he is initially placed on suicide watch for six months. This is a way of making sure that an individual who is incarcerated doesn't come to harm. However... Unknown to Jennifer and unknown to the investigators as well, he's then moved into the general prison population. And on the 10th of May 2010, he's found hanged in his cell. He'd used bed sheets to take his own life. He was 40 years of age. On one level, we can all say, ah, oh, well, is this the guilt culminating? He tried unsuccessfully to take his life before and the gravity and reality of what he had done to this poor child has now become so overwhelming that he can no longer survive. But I don't believe that. I don't think that he killed himself because of that guilt. I think he did it because unlike the last time when there was still hope, he was free. Nobody knew what he'd done. He was able to readjust his life. He was able to reinvent himself. He was able to do things a free man can do. Well, that was enough potentially to keep him from dying on the outside. But now he's on the inside, and let's be honest, he's looking at probably forever incarcerated. There is no hope. And so he makes a choice, which is to have the power in that moment over that situation and to choose not to serve the time. And that's grating for any victim. And when investigators tell Jennifer she is literally beyond distraught, She'd waited 20 years to face that man in court, to stand and look her attacker in the eyes, to read her victim impact statement to him, to let him hear the words that she had so often wanted to speak. You know, he'd almost taken a life as a child, and now she felt like he'd robbed her of this absolute final opportunity to let him hear what he had done and also what he had failed to do which was to steal her life and to prevent her from having the future she deserved. She was a survivor and she wanted to look at him and let him know that. She also wanted him to serve a long sentence. She knew what he did to her was completely reprehensible and wrong and he deserved to pay for the crime. She said, I felt like he owed me the time in the courtroom. He owed me the time he was gonna spend in jail. He owed me being able to voice my victim impact statement in an instant. He ripped that all away and I felt that was really unfair. And it, it is. Not only did he try to deny her life, he tried to deny her closure. So again, do I feel that he was guilty? No. If he had felt guilty about what he did to her, he would have let her have her moment. He would have listened. He would have respected the fact that she had that right. But Jennifer is not an individual who is going to accept that situation as it was. Remember, this is a warrior, a survivor. She's a fighter. She's not going to let him have the last word, so to speak. So she decides that she'll get closure in a different way. So on the 10th of August 2010, 
this is 20 years to the day that that brutal attack that almost took her life was carried out. She visits Bradford's grave and she reads the victim impact statement. She asked her husband if he thought that Bradford would be listening. She really wanted that reassurance that this man, this monster, who had taken so much from her, would be made to confront her words. And she asked him that question, and as she's walking to his grave, she's bitten by an ant on her leg. And she said in that moment, she just took it, that this was a sign that he would hear her words. That ant connecting that little child, that little eight-year-old girl with the woman, the warrior that she was that day. So she reads the statement through her tears and part of it read this. Dennis Bradford, I waited 19 years, two months and three days to find out your last name and for you to be caught. You chose the wrong little 45 pound eight year old girl to try to murder because for 19 years, I've thought of you every single day and helped in searching for you. In my heart, I knew you were out there, alive, either in prison or living a lie. And now I know, listening to my heart all of these years and never giving up on finding you, I was right. She's such a powerful woman, isn't she? You know, think about it. Jennifer spent her entire life living with the physical and mental scars of her attack. But there have been such bright lights in this woman's life. She met the man of her dreams, Jonathan Martinez, and he really helped the healing process. However, when Jennifer was 25, she was actually diagnosed with hydrocelthinks, which is a condition where the fallopian tubes are blocked. They're basically filled with fluid. Bear in mind what her mother was told when the attack happened, that she would never likely be able to have children. The experts who looked at her condition said it had probably been caused by the severe sexual assault that she'd suffered as a child. And she was told that she was unlikely that she would ever have children naturally. But you know what? An incredible soul heard about her case. And this fertility expert just got in touch and they arranged for her to have IVF. And I have to have help having children and it's a very difficult process. And you're not guaranteed of a child at the end. And you can't imagine that for somebody like Jennifer with her history, knowing that this man may have stolen her future children that must have been incredibly challenging for her to deal with on a psychological level. But this fertility expert works with her and miraculously she goes on to have a little girl called Jenna in 2012. And then she has a boy, Jonah, in 2016, which is just such a wonderful thing to know. Jennifer and the investigators who cracked this case, Crummy and Renison, they now travel the country because they wanna share her story with law enforcement officials. They want victim advocacy groups to hear about her case because they have a really clear message in their talks. And whilst there are only three words in their main message, the weight, the emphasis, the magnitude of what they are saying in those words cannot be underestimated because their message is clear. It's to never give up, never give up such a powerful thing to tell victim groups and investigators. It's just such a simple but true message. If you never give up, if you always work and believe and move forward, carrying on believing that in the end you will achieve your goal, then the likelihood is you will achieve your goal. And for Jennifer, that's testament to what she achieved with Chromium Renison. You know, she didn't do it alone, but it was her desire to never let go and their desire to bring this man to justice, whoever he was, that means that, yes, yeah, she didn't get to see him serve his prison sentence, but she knows that the world is safe from him. It's incredible to think that Jennifer goes around as an advocate now in these groups because Jennifer lost her voice following the attack. But my God, did she find it again? And does she want to make sure that 
every other victim of attacks that they also find their voice or if they are not here to have that voice that she will be the voice for them. She says the scars that I have on my body represent a time in my life when I was scared and left helpless but they also represent survival. You may be left with scars but you can blossom into something powerful. The investigators who finally cracked her case and brought her closure remain a really close part of Jennifer's personal life. So these men, these investigators, they were not just in it to crack the case. They were in it to let an eight-year-old child know that she had great meaning. And to be able to deliver that message to the woman that that eight-year-old child became and to be able to embrace her as a human being and work with her in helping other victims find their way forward, to help other people be given closure in these circumstances is just such an incredibly, incredibly humbling message. The fact that they want to be part of her life, not just part of the case, well, it makes perfect sense that they were the right guys to be put on that job, doesn't it? Because they were so committed, so connected to her as a human being, as a child, and to justice in general, that they have become essentially a part of one another's family. You know, friends of the family that we choose, and certainly in this case, this trio of individuals represent that. As ever, guys, I hope you found this case interesting, and I hope that it's filled you with a sense of hope. It's really difficult in true crime to ever get a sense of joy because we're always talking about victims and there's always a darkness to the stories. But in this case, I think that whilst we can't say there is joy in relation to what happened, the joy I get listening to Jennifer, seeing the strength, commitment, and also the connection that she has with the investigators and the joy I feel that they are using their experiences to help others, it's really humbling, isn't it? If you have found it an intriguing case. If you know more about it, if you want to share your own stories, please get involved in the comments below. If you've liked watching this and want to see more of my content, I release it on a Wednesday and a Sunday. Give me a like, subscribe, but more than anything, just a massive shout out to Jennifer and her incredible survival story. It just is resoundingly clear that when so often we question our capacity to survive, people like Jennifer remind us of the self-power that each and every one of us has within us if we just allow it to surface. She is a survivor and that's so important. We can be victims, but in the end, if we seek justice, if we work hard, if we recognize that we deserve more, then we can become true survivors. Take care guys, be safe and I'll see you again next time.